Yeah, so it's great. It's really great to be down here with all of you. This is, in fact, as your rector has said, a kind of momentous occasion because confirmation, in my opinion, is a really courageous thing to do. It's courageous because what you're saying, in essence, before this group of people and you representing families, friends, neighbors, all kinds of people that you are willing to publicly make a stand, that you are willing to say, I am identifying myself in front of everybody as someone who is committing himself to Christ Jesus. And in the world in which we live now, that is a really courageous thing to do. Because you and I know that there are plenty of people for whom that's just not true at all. And in fact, there are actually some people who would think it would be pretty strange for you to make that kind of commitment at all. After all, there are all kinds of religions out there. Why do you want to follow Jesus? And, and why do you even want to be particularly religious? And so to say here this morning, yes, we're making that commitment. We are, in fact, believers and followers of Christ. And we're demonstrating that by coming forward for confirmation or reception or reaffirmation is really a wonderful and extraordinary thing. In fact, once the sermon's over, I'll explain a little bit about the meaning of the choreography that, of how I pray with people and how that symbolizes both the depth and the courage of that kind of commitment. And it is that courage and that commitment to which the disciples were called in the Gospel reading this morning. You, you know the story. It's actually really familiar if you've been in Sunday school. That as Jesus began to move closer and closer toward his crucifixion and his resurrection, knowing that at the crucifixion, hardly anyone would understand what was really going on, and they would want to run away, he wanted to give them undeniable proof that he was, in fact, who he said he was. Son of God, Savior and Redeemer of the world. No one ever like him before him. No one would be after him ever like him. Unique in all of human history. God in the flesh showing the world who God really was. I mean, Jesus would say, and remember at one point, Philip, one of the disciples comes and says, Lord, show us the Father, meaning show us what Jesus, show us what God is really like. And Jesus said to Philip, Philip, if you've seen me, You've seen the Father. In other words, who I am, the way I act, the way I talk to people, the miracles that I do, the answers to prayer, the wisdom, all of that is God coming through me in a way that the world has never seen either before or since. And so here they are at this turning point because all of this ministry has taken place and from this experience that his disciples will have in this reading, Jesus begins to, as the scripture says, make his way toward Jerusalem, meaning he's moving, knowing that there he will be arrested, he will be tried, he will be convicted, he will be sent to capital punishment, death on the cross, for blasphemy, insurrection against Rome. And then on the third day, he would rise again from the dead. So what Jesus does is that he takes, in essence, his closest followers with him off to pray by themselves. The disciples, Peter, James, and John, they had no idea what's about to happen. Jesus would often just go off by himself to pray. And so it may have seemed a little odd that this time he wants them to come with him. But they do. And what happens is something that absolutely astonishes them. A special effect better than any in any Steven Spielberg movie. All of a sudden, Jesus is praying, but all of a sudden, Jesus is changed. He's in the regular robe of a Galilean carpenter, and it, it's transformed to literally glow, filled with light. And then if that somehow wasn't enough, there's an appearance of, in front of him of two men, Moses and Elijah. And they're talking together. We have no idea what it was that they've said, except that the scripture says they talked about, in essence, what was about to happen when he goes to Jerusalem, meaning his crucifixion and resurrection. It's important to notice that who these two people are. Because in many ways, Moses and Elijah 
are symbolic of the whole tradition of Judaism that predates the coming of Jesus. In essence, the law, in Moses, the prophets, and Elijah. Giving, in essence, these Jewish disciples the sense that Jesus is greater than Moses. He's greater than Elijah. And he is, in fact, not just greater, but he is the fulfillment of all that they spoke about, all that they did. He is the natural heir and the completer of all that they started. So the symbolism of these two men showing up there on the mountain with him is meant to communicate that kind of message to Peter, James, and John. But what happens is, is that they're terrified. I mean, wouldn't you be terrified? And so Peter kind of doesn't know what to say. And so what he does in his own sort of fumbling language is that what he wants to do is create a shrine. He says, Lord, um, it's really good for us to be here. I mean, I can almost sort of hear the panic in his voice. Um, I know what we'll do. Why don't we make three booths, like three shrines? One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. It's almost as if he doesn't know what he's saying. In fact, that's what one of the gospel readers mentions. Peter had no idea what he was talking about. As is true for some of us, sometimes our mouth gets in gear before our mind does. And that's really what's happening here with Peter. And so what happens is, is that because God wants to be absolutely certain that they get the message, notice what happens. After he says that, while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them. Now, that's even scarier still. What if it had been a completely beautiful night, nothing but stars, you're on a vista on this mountaintop. You're already seeing something that no human being has ever seen before. Jesus literally aflame with light, Moses and Elijah being there, and then what happens? All of a sudden this cloud rolls. So thick that you can't see your hand in front of your face. At this point, they went from fear to stark terror. They were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that says, in essence, you're not getting what I'm trying to say to you. This is my son. Different, you see, from Moses and Elijah. My chosen. Listen to him. And then when the voice had spoken, all of a sudden, clouds rolled back. Moses and Elijah have disappeared. The only person there is, is Jesus. In other words, get this, disciples, there's no one like him. He is the fulfillment of everything that has passed. He is standing before you, the very Son of the living God. This is my Son. Listen to Him. Follow Him. Obey Him. Make Him the one that you're paying attention to. It's a new day. It's not the day of Moses and Elijah anymore. It's now the day of Jesus. And your job is to listen to Him, to follow Him, to go after Him. Now, they don't know what to do. It says, and they kept silent. In the, and they told no one about any of the things that they had seen. Well, of course they did. Can you imagine going back to your neighbor and saying, Jesus was absolutely filled with light. And they go, have you been drinking? <laughs> of course no one would believe that. So no, they didn't tell. They didn't tell until after the resurrection. And they had seen him die. They now see him fully alive. And at that point, they are, in fact, completely convinced that everything that Jesus said about himself was true. And because that was the case, they were willing to live fearless lives as men and women who were committed to telling other people that the one whom they know is, in fact, the Son of God. That takes us to St. Anne's this morning. Because in fact the commitments that are being made today by these who will come forward are the similar commitments that have been asked to Peter and James and John. Yes, I'm willing to say that I am convinced Jesus is who he says he is. He is the Son of God. And therefore my commitment is to follow him as best I know how. Literally all the days of my life.
But, and this is the wonder of it, it's not just that they are making a commitment to God. God also is making a commitment to them. This is a two-way street. Jesus says to his disciples, I will never leave you or forsake you. Nothing can take you out of my hand. So that in that commitment is not only their commitment to Christ, but his commitment to his companionship, and not just with them or around them, but even within them, in them in a way that actually changes who they are. Paul in the, the reading in 2 Corinthians puts it this way. He said, we are being transformed. Because as I follow Jesus, as I do my best to follow him, as I talk to him about what's going on in my day, as I ask for his wisdom and for his guidance, I'm not just sort of speaking up to the ceiling and then my prayers fall down. I have one who literally has surrounded me with his presence, who is within me who not only hears what I ask for, but actually touches the deepest part of who I am. He changes the depths of my own heart. And that's even symbolized in confirmation. So that when they come forward and make those commitments, I don't just sort of put my hands like here and go, that's nice, have a nice life. No, what I do, I put my hands on them, I pray for them, I'm asking for God to impart his life and his blessing in them, even as they have made that commitment to be in and with him. So in some ways, it's a divine exchange. They say yes to Christ, Christ says yes to them. Knowing that in that commitment, they are with him and he is with them forever. That's exactly what we enact in communion. We come forward and we place our hands like this. We're extending our hands asking for God to bless us. This is the position of a beggar asking for the mercy of God. And what does God do in respond? He gives us himself, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Jesus, you see, puts it this way. If anyone comes to me, I will never turn that one away. That is an absolutely indissoluble promise. And so all that we do is we're saying yes to Christ and we can count on the fact that Christ also, every time, says yes to us. Amen.